Welcome to the Savvy Doc Podcast. I'm certified financial planner professional, Catherine Magana, a Savvy Doc Financial Planners. And I'm here with marketing manager, Jocelyn Magana, also known as my husband. And we're here to help you take smart control of your money and your life. Today's podcast, we will have a special discussion with Dr. Tarang Patel. He's the host of Dr. Money Matters, and he has over 60 podcasts with financial-related topics, professional-related topics, and much more. And so we're really excited to have you here with us today, Dr. Patel, and thank you for joining our podcast. Thanks for having me. Great. So why don't we get started? Um, Why don't you share with our listeners a little bit about your background? Sure. Uh, I'm a radiologist in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, I've been uh, out of training now for about 10, uh, 10 years, 10, 11 years, I guess. It's been, it seems like it uh, wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Um, and uh, I work for a large hospital system here uh, as an employed radiologist. Um, and I've always been interested in financial uh, topics. Um, uh, even uh, back in college days, I was started off you know, as a business major and then switched to pre-med. Uh, but uh, uh, when I when I got out, uh, I was in the Air Force uh, prior to my fellowship as a, as a, and I was a radiologist in the Air Force. And then prior uh, to getting out of the Air Force, getting out of fellowship, or sorry, after getting out of the Air Force and getting out of fellowship, I, um, you know, I, I was kind of thrown into the world of uh, uh, being an attending, you know, making some, uh, decent money. Uh, and I just didn't want to, you know, make, uh, make too many financial mistakes. So I kind of just tr- started reading up as much as I could. Well, it's interesting. Uh, you mentioned you have that business background in education as well. So I'm sure that kind of helped you led you a little bit more into the financial realm and, and really wanting to control your, your finances. Um, so, I guess, so how did you get started then with Dr. Money Matters? And, you know, you mentioned a little bit about um, your fellowship. And so is that where you decided to kind of do the podcast or what, what really uh, preempted uh, you to do that? No, when I, when actually, when I got out of fellowship, uh, it was still I think there might have been podcasts around, but podcasts were not very popular by any stretch. So I hadn't heard of any podcasts at that point. Um, and that was so I actually was just doing, you know, kind of online reading. And there really was a lot of like scattered information, um, but there wasn't, you know, really great resources put together. Uh, and so it, it kind of got me interested. And then I, a couple of years down the line, I started listening to other podcasts and audio books and things like that. And I was like, oh, I kind of like this format more than, um, than, than reading, uh, you know, because partly when I'm commuting back and forth to work, uh, I could use that time to be a little bit more productive and educate myself. Uh, so I was listening to other podcasts and, uh, you know, it was interesting because I was like, this is, this is a good format. Um, for for me to learn, and I'm and I not that I had any background in audio or radio or anything like that, but uh, prior to med school, I was uh, a web designer, and I kind of had some computer knowledge and internet knowledge, and so I was like, you know, it must not be that hard to put together a podcast, uh, <laughs> and so I kind of started down the rabbit hole of of doing a podcast, and then. Um, the, the other part that got me interested in the financial topics was when I started my, uh, the, um, my job as a radiologist. Currently, I had two other colleagues uh, that were, we started, you know, we finished fellowship and we took the same uh, uh, job and we all kind of had similar financial questions. Some of my other colleagues were also just one or two years ahead of me. So we, we all kind of had, we we're in the same boat financially and there weren't that many senior people in my group there was some turnover and so you didn't really have as much uh guidance from you know your colleagues Uh, so we were all kind of looking together and just kind of learning from each other so is there anything that you learned about yourself by doing these podcasts and and meeting some different professionals is there anything that you learned um you know personally about yourself it's it's interesting i i think that i've learned that i I'm not as introverted as I thought I might have been. Um, I, you know, in the podcast format, it seems like you're like we right now, we're just talking as a con, you know, a conversation, even though it can go uh, to as many people uh, as have access to uh, the internet. Uh, But it still seems kind of uh, 
uh, you know, just a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-two -on -two or whatever conversation. And so it, it felt, I felt less uh, nervous, I think, than I would have. Uh, whereas when I, you know, was giving presentations uh, for, for work in front of a group of colleagues or when I was a medical student resident, things like that, I would always get super nervous. And I, for some reason, I didn't get as nervous. I don't know why. Uh, with podcasting. And so I kind of liked that. And then it also helped me reach out to people that I probably would have had no business talking to <laughs> otherwise. Um, and so it was, it was, it was fun doing that. And so it sounds to me, you know, looking, I, I saw your podcast list and you have so many different topics and um, it's interesting that it's, you know, once again, it's financial and prof professional related and there's so many different things to consider and think about um, and really navigating through some of that um, information as a physician, because here you are, you're practicing and you have your life and you're, but you're also trying to make decisions that um, impact you. So I definitely think there's a lot of value in, in, um, the, in the episodes and things that you have done in the past. So I, I really, um, and I know it's a lot of work and uh, so I think. Yeah, it's a lot, a of, lot of work. It's <laughs> definitely. It's a lot, lot more work than people realize. I, I mean, it is and it isn't, you know, but uh, um, you know, understanding that you, like, like Catherine said, you have a practice, uh, you know, you have a family from what it sounds like you have, you have a family. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Married with kids. Yeah. And, um, uh, to be able to also, you know, like you said, reach out and, um, edit and put these things together uh, for other people, you know, I think that's, that's pretty amazing. Yeah. I, and to be honest, uh, when I started, I, you know, there, were, there wasn't as much software, uh, and apps to kind of help you do this. It was much more labor intensive, uh, down the line, it's gotten a little bit easier, but um, it's still, you know, and you guys can uh, attest to it. It's it's pretty, uh, unlike putting, you know, typing something on a blog and then just putting it out there. And, you know, if you edit it a little bit as you need to, it's it's not too, too difficult. With the podcast, there's a lot more that goes uh, into it. And so I probably haven't been as diligent. Uh, well, and I haven't been in the last year and a half, uh, uh, with the podcast as I would have, as I was before, but, uh, but it is interesting. Uh, it was, it's, you know, I learned a lot, um, and, and hopefully I can bring it back someday. <laughs> well, yeah, you, it looks like you put a lot of work into it and that, and that's how we found you. Um, you know, I, I noticed it looked like the impetus, at least you're like in your intro introduction page on the, on the blog was really, you know, helping other, other physicians and, and doctors achieve, financial independence. And that, that's a really interesting concept when, when you have like the fire movement and, and, and that sort of thing. And, and then I also was taking a look at uh, one of your last blog posts uh, with regards to financial independence and then conversations as, as you and I have, have discussed before, my, my father's a physician coming towards his um, retirement uh, years. Um, and I'm interested to hear from you and this might be an interesting discussion is what does financial independence mean to you and what do you think it means for physicians? Well, I think it, it, it's very different from physician to physician, right? Uh, it, it means, you know, the numbers are obviously different for, for everyone, uh, lifestyle dependent, uh, situational, you know, whether you're supporting, not just, you know, yourself, your family, extended family. Um, and then if you're in private practice or you have built a practice, you know, your employees, things like that. So it's very different from physician to physician. That said, um, you know, the, the thing that I try to discuss with physicians of, of whatever, um, you know, whatever situation they have is that by being financially independent. And, and I'm, I like to differentiate fi fire versus just financially independent because mm, yep, yep. some people want to retire early and, you know, more power to them. Uh, others really want to continue doing what they're doing um, or maybe do it a little bit less, you know, do it more on their own terms. And that's kind of where I'm uh, focusing on is mm. that most of us didn't go to med school to retire early. Right. Um, you know, right. I mean, it's, it's, it's a long process. It's, you know, very intense for many years and, you know, and then even when you're done with your training, uh, you know, when you first come in, you're working really hard just to keep up with the, the realities of being an attending and, and what regular, uh, practice is like, whether you're an academic and you're publishing or teaching or whether you're in private practice and, you know, you're just 
dealing with multiple patients, multiple offices, things like that. Uh, so you, you start that and it, it, to me, it seems like it's kind of a shame that, you know, you, you, you spend 10 years getting there and you may only spend five or six years, you know, if you really are, are, are diligent and happen to have a good market and things like that, and then get out. I just feel like it's such a, it, it, it's, it's not the best thing. Uh, but you know, I'm not disparaging anyone who's done it. I just feel like it's kind of a waste, um, for, for your time. And, and also just the skills that you develop over time, you don't magically become an excellent attending the day you're finished training. Right. You know, those skills continue to develop over time. And, you know, you're peaking your, most people would say you're peaking in your, uh, physician's, um, ability balanced with your knowledge later on in your career. And so, but it, so I like I would love for people to continue practicing, but the reason I talk about the independence part is that you can do it more on your own terms, and that's where I think a lot of people are are looking now. Um, the external stressors in in medicine, whether it's the administrative side, whether it's you know lawsuits, whether it's financial pressures, whatever, are driving physicians into burnout. And that really is what this ends up being a big discussion about is burnout because you have so many pressures coming at you and most physicians just get on that treadmill and then they just keep working harder, working harder. And that's all they know how to do, but they don't really know how to take care of themselves, know how to use finances to improve their life, um, make good decisions. And so I try to teach them, okay, if you make the good decisions as early as you can, you'll have freedom to do what you want, whether that is continuing to practice the, you know, at a, at a, at a really strong pace, whether it's cutting back or whether if, if you choose to, you know, uh, leave medicine and do something else, it just gives you options. And, and that to me, having the optionality is, is probably the best thing you can do. And, and, and being good with, uh, finances, I don't mean like investing. Well, I mean, right you know, taking care of your finances um, is is really a, a good way to do that. I mean, that that's a whole nother discussion, right? There's the difference between uh, investing and being a good investor. And, and then and another one, you'd think they go hand in hand, but they, they don't always of, of being good with your money from a, a day-to-day perspective. Those are <laughs> almost two different sk- skill sets. Absolutely. In fact, if you would talk to most people today, uh, right now, you, you're, the skill set of being an astute, uh, you know, investor has nothing to do with the returns in the in the last few years, right? right. So it's interesting. Um, we've talked to many doctors over the years, and it's you mentioned the burnout, and um, you know we've heard about that. And one of the things we, I've heard a lot of is um, a lot of doctors like to travel, and so I think over this last eighteen months, I'm sure that changed for a lot of physicians, especially that those that wanted to go overseas and they really needed that downtime. Um, but so I think, you know, things financially that also changes your, you know, financial impact too is, okay, if I'm not traveling as much, what am I doing with that money? And then also looking at income. Um, I think, you know, over the last 12 to 18 months, we've seen a lot of changes. Um, some doctors are making more money, some are making less, and just it really depends on your specialty. But it, it does seem to me that there's a lot more um, administrative and um, we're hearing a lot more about burnout. Um, but I'm sure that you you probably hear or experience that yourself. What's your take on that, Dr. Patel? I mean, the pandemic's been, you know, I guess it really depends on your specialty, but but what, what is your take on how the this pandemic has affected medicine and doctors overall, you know, I, I, from a, from an economic standpoint, from an economic standpoint, I would say early on, uh, in the pandemic, most doctors took a pretty significant hit, um, other than maybe some of the, you know, critical care physicians who were kind of recruited outside of their own area to kind of, uh, help, but a lot of them did it altruistically. They weren't mm, necessarily yeah. being paid. Yeah. Um, but most uh, physicians took a cut either in production or just in income uh, because volumes that were not related to COVID, like a lot of, you know, a lot of surgeries were on hold, a lot of yeah. elective uh, healthcare was on hold. And so many of them took a pretty significant cut. And if you're an employee 
most employers, you know, reduced salary or reduced bon- you know, bonuses. You weren't reaching your productivity marks. Um, so that was a problem. And if you're in private practice, obviously, you know, you, you weren't bringing in patients, but you were still having your uh, general expenses. So uh, I, I would say most doctors took a hit. Now, in the second uh, and third waves, it's probably kind of evened up a little bit because dur- during the waves, everything else kind of decreases. But during the, the, the lower parts, the valleys, I would say, uh, we've had a lot more people come in. In fact, there was an a article um, just yesterday, I think, on, uh, I was posted, I was on NPR, but it, and a lot of doctors commented on social media, and it was basically saying that you're seeing a lot more patients and a lot sicker patients. So, uh, and and most doctors were confirming that experience, uh, especially those who are working in, um, you know, uh, emergency settings or academic centers. And that definitely is, uh, you know, uh, it, it, it is what I'm seeing. Uh, is that we had a wave of very sick people who weren't necessarily, you know, during the the down parts of COVID, who'd come in because they didn't come in during the the peaks of COVID, and so their cancers were more advanced, or they had more, um, you know, like they might have had belly pain, and they would have come in, didn't come in, and then they had a perforation of bowel, so it was a lot, you know, worse, um, and so that's that. So, so, you know, towards income, it probably started picking back up, but the amount of work you were doing was was high and intense as opposed to more routine work. Yeah, I, and I can only imagine all those the, the catch up appointments, right? Like, you, like you just mentioned, has got to. So, you, so you got to deal with the COVID scenario, and then, and then when things level out, like you said, in between the waves, then then you've got all these people who have put off coming to the doctor, stacking up the appointments. Um, and, and then you have these, uh, God, that's, that's, I, I was just thinking about that. The, the, I guess, I don't know what, I imagine you have a medical term for it, but I, I'm going to call it like a, almost like a, a shadow fall, uh, shadow fallout from a health, health, uh, care perspective, meaning that people that didn't, like you said, didn't catch things early, right. That are, are going to yeah. be more, more ill because they didn't, they weren't able to go in for tests or like you said, weren't getting things treated that that maybe have been bugging them that uh, they, they never thought to go in. That that's all. That's all. That's in a probably a, a, an enormous population. That's I'm not it seeing is. a lot of press about. It is. Um, I, I know. You know. Uh, in talking with colleagues around the country, they were definitely seeing a lot of that uh, more advanced uh, diseases uh, than they had been used to seeing. And what ends up happening is the people who let's say, you know, had something that they may have seen the doctor for in a normal situation, but it went away and they're fine. They're not going to come in for those appointments. So you've lost those appointments, which is, you know, okay, maybe they weren't turning in anything, but the people that are coming in now, so you're self-selecting for people who are just sicker and sicker because it, it progressed or, you know, it's, it's persisting. Um, and so the balance that was there was, you know, some really sick people, some maybe not so sick people, uh, previously, now it's just a higher percentage of much more acute uh, 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 patients, and and that itself can wear on the uh, physician uh, and, and and healthcare workers too, because you're just going from sick person to sick person to sick person without any, you know, downtime, and that's that's separate from the sick person of COVID, the sick person of COVID, the sick person of COVID. So, right, um, that's that's the biggest thing that I'm seeing now. Uh, in talking to other physicians is that level of, you know, you, you basically cycling between COVID intensity and other intensity. Yeah. It's just not stopping. And yeah. And so that's, that's, a uh, that's tough. It's very tough to, yeah, that's uh, gotta be brutal. Really, yeah. So are there any other, um, life experiences or anything that maybe you've gone through that perhaps that you wish you knew more about earlier in your career or anything financially that maybe you wish you knew, um, you know, right out of your residency versus where you're at now? Yeah, I think uh, one thing that is not discussed too much in residency, and I actually, uh, my father is a physician, so I've had some background in, in this also, um, you know, seeing what he's gone through and the changes in medicine. But 
Uh, he's he's a psychiatrist, or he well he's retired now, but he was a psychiatrist in private practice. But um, you know when I went into uh, radiology and I was he was in the Midwest, I was in the East Coast at an academic place. There's very little talk about the business of of mm. medicine, the business of not just personal finance, um, but just the business of medicine in general. Right. And 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 so you know if they could incorporate those kind of uh, ideas. And it, I think some of it is just that it's not, it's money itself is a taboo topic and especially in medicine, especially in academic medicine. So I, I feel like those kind of things are, Hey, how do you, not just how do you find a job, but how do you look at the economics of a job? How do you look at the economics of a practice? How do you build a practice? Those kind of things are really not taught, uh, unless you're at very specific, you know, a few programs that may do it, but most don't, most of your mentors, especially in academic medicine, really have no idea because that's, that's not the world they're in. Um, and so those kind of things I think should be encouraged, discussed because, you know, we're all involved. I mean, healthcare is what, 20% of the economy and everyone complains every year about healthcare costs going up. I know I complain about it myself because every year I see more, right insurance costs, you know, that I'm paying, even though my income doesn't go up. Uh, so I think those things are, you know, things that we need to discuss. Uh, and I wish I would have had more background on it. Um, yeah. I mean, essentially you're, you're running a, a, a business and, um, you know, with, with, with serious revenues and, um, a, a lot of different technical moving parts from, you know, the bureaucracy, the billing, um, documentation, uh, dealing with insurance companies. I mean, that, that that's a whole nother monster completely. And and even if you buy a building or if you are in partnership or there are buy-sell agreements, I mean, there's so many things from the business side of it if, if you are in private practice um, to consider as well. Absolutely. And, you know, yeah, uh, I mean, the, it's just, it's like a whole other education that you don't get uh, and you're kind of thrown into and, and basically you end up after training, you know, most people end up, either employed by uh, a big health system or joining a large group practice. Um, and they may learn some of it, but you're, you're actually pushing doctors further away uh, from, from the economics of healthcare. And to me, that's a bad thing. Uh, that's, that's one of the reasons I think we're kind of in this mess in, as a nation in healthcare is that the people who provide the care and the people who receive the care become so disintermediated from the economics of it, right? You pay your insurance company, they then pay or not pay or whatever uh, your healthcare provider. Right. It's, it's not like it used to be way back when. If, if uh, I needed some healthcare, I go see the doctor. I either pay him with, directly with, with the money I have or I, I trade him for services or, or you know, barter with wh whatever I have to offer. Uh, the, the money's not going A to B anymore. It's going... And, a and and when the when it was going A to B, right? If you had, if you knew your doctor and you had a you know bad economics you know situation or or for one year or whatever, you could work out something directly with your doctor. You can't do that anymore. No, or no, I, I I remember yeah. those, those days because yeah. we'd have products showing up at my house, you know, right. and uh, you know pallets of strawberries that were endless, you know. Yeah, and 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 that was okay. Yeah. And doctors weren't making insane amounts of money back then. And, and they're not making insane amounts of money right now. But the difference is you're paying, we're all paying insane amount of money to have access to care, but we're not really getting the, the, any different care than we were before. It seems like it's almost, look, I, I'm, I don't know the intricacies of the healthcare, so I'm, I'm speaking maybe a little bit out of turn here, but from a lay person from the outside and talking to, to you know, physicians and doctors, it almost seems like that money is inflated, but it's going to pay you know, this third party, right? Um, the, almost the, the, the business side that, that like you said, uh, the doctors are kind of being de detached from. And of course, the, the patients aren't really aware of how the whole machine works. It's, uh, it's an amazing business uh, model if you're the insurance company, right? Who does the patient get mad at directly? It's the, the doctor. doctor. Even though in the back of their mind, they're mad at the insurance company. Uh, no, they get mad at the doctor because 
that's who they have access to. You can't get a hold of the insurance company. You can't yell at their CEO. Well, they're the face, right? They're exactly. the face. They're the, they're the exactly. person that they see, the person they deal with. I'll just uh, make one more comment. There was an article that came out this week in the Journal of the American Medical Association talking about financial uh, you know, uh, numbers in healthcare. And they broke down that healthcare itself is a $4 trillion um, uh, you know, expense or, or cost in the economy. Right. One trillion of that, or, or almost like 990 billion, something like something basically, you know, 25% is related to administrative costs. So basically, you know, only 75% is actually potentially going towards care. And even there, that's somewhat uh, nebulous. But all physician salaries put together are only 8%. And if you add everyone else who's directly involved in healthcare, nurses, technologists, uh, you know, the, the hospital, even the hospital janitorial staff, basically everyone involved in the, you know, in the hospital who are not in the administrative side, um, it, adds, it, it adds another 10%. So like roughly 18 to 20% of all healthcare costs are salaries of healthcare workers, but 25% is administrative costs. And, th and that's not what's being presented to the public. Exactly. The public um, is told that insurance equals healthcare, but it doesn't. <laughs> healthcare is healthcare. Access is a different story, you know, and they're, they're providing access, but they're really not. What's well, interesting. So cir circling back a little bit, um, for, for, you know, understanding all of that. And, and I have two brothers who are, are looking to, my dad had a second family. I got two brothers that are in college right now. They're both looking, you know, they're going down the medical track. Mm -hmm. Um, and, 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 um, one of the things that I, I really loved about your blog and your podcast are, you know, how passionate you are about giving back to the medical community, giving advice, you know, from experience, um, so that other people can, like you said, draw from not necessarily direct mentors. If they have those, that's, that's amazing. But if they don't, they can go to somewhere like your podcast, but what, what, what would you say? What would you say is like the most common mistake you've seen doctors make financially that, that, um, it's almost like a blind spot, you know, where, um, they come out of residency, they get going and it, and it just seems like it's, 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 it's a pothole that everybody's stepping in. I, I think the, the biggest thing that doctors do, um, and it's a human, it's a behavioral thing is you start out time-wise and money-wise behind your colleagues, right? You, you've, you've spent, uh, you know, after, after your college friends are for the most part working or they've gone to grad school for a couple of years, uh, and then they start working and there's, you know, de leading their life, whatever you're in med school for four years. Uh, then you're in training from anywhere from three to 10 years beyond that. So you really start out, uh, significantly behind the economic and time curve amongst people that you, you know, your colleagues, uh, and so the, the natural tendency is to catch up. And how do you catch up? You're like, well, I want to live a life. I mean, you know, my, uh, my fraternity brother from college uh, has a, you know, is married and has, a ki uh, has kids and they have a house and, you know, they live a life. And, and you've been in the books or in the hospital for X number of years and you, you just want to jump in. And, and, and I mean, I, I can't blame anyone because it's no, like we also all. see on the other end, you know, we also see mortality uh, frequently. So, you know, that, you know, nothing's guaranteed. Um, and so it, the biggest mistake is to not, is to just jump too far into commitments of, you know, financial commitments or any kind of commitments, but basically you've lived poor uh, as a student or as a resident for so long, you, you just jump into, I got to get that nice car. I got to get that nice house. I got to get those things. Um, and sometimes it's not just you, but it could be, you know, your partner, your spouse, your, your, your family that kind of puts that pressure on you. Hey, you're, you're a doctor now, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a, it's an understandable situation, but it does put you behind if things don't work out uh, the way, the way they, uh, they don't always work out. It's interesting you say that um, I've helped some physicians with some financial planning and, you know, they want to buy the big house and the car. And, and then we also have to look at the student loans and debt. And so it's just, you know, it's again, having that balance and figuring out 
what the priorities are. And it's not a one size fits all. Everybody has, you know, at the end of the day, it's your life, but you also have to know, you know, what's the impact for the decisions that you're making for your future. So it's, um, in, and what do those numbers look like for those decisions that you make? And so that's where um, I see a lot of financial planning and collaboration comes into play. Um, you know, like I said, you have that behavioral side, you want to go do some things, but sometimes you, you know, taking a step back and looking at what's the impact is, is just as important. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, we, we, we are, we are all human after all. And we, Absolutely. You, know, you can, you can only uh, uh, suppress uh, the urges to uh, spend a little bit because you've, you've worked so hard. You des- you do deserve to, uh, you know, live a little bit. I don't, I don't have any problem with that. I'm not of the mindset that you shouldn't, um, go out and, you know, you should just live so strictly and frugally for the rest of, uh, you know, until you pay off everything. I, I don't believe in that. I do believe that you have to have a deliberate plan. You have to have uh, an a goal in mind and you kind of have to, you have to understand that, you know, not every job works out right off the bat. And it, and, and that's more and more the case because most doctors are not starting their own practices any longer. So you are joining, whether it's, like I said, a hospital or a, a large practice, and you kind of have to see how you fit if you do fit. And if you don't, what are your options? You may not be able to practice in the area because of a non-compete, uh, and you may have to go somewhere else. So those, you know, those are things that you have to factor in that I don't think most residents uh, really think about. And, and so like these, these, that's the kind of things that I want to discuss, uh, uh, with, with, you know, new grads, uh, because I'm like, those are the issues that no one tells you about when you're applying to medical school. Cause they don't think about it. Well, that's, that's life experience, right? That's, that's, yeah. that's, 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 that's not stocks. That's not exactly budgeting, right? That that's life right. experience that, that you can right. only get, like you said, from somebody who has been down the road and is conscious of that, that scenario and, and where that could lead if, if, uh, y- y- you play it wrong. Exactly. Well, it looks like we've gone over a lot of information today, and we really appreciate your insights and you being on this podcast with us. Um, I guess, is there one main takeaway or anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners before we wrap up? Uh, you know, I, I do like to tell doctors, uh, and I, I tell these uh, to the medical students and the residents that rotate with me all the time. Uh, you may not be interested in finance and that's fine. I have no, you know, not every way, like I like it, but you know, uh, not, it's not everyone's a cup of tea, but just remember it's important. Uh, and it's going to, you know, impact your life, uh, just the same way that your health is going to impact your life. And so you have to have some, you, you got to get some basic knowledge. It's just, it's just mandatory. You don't have to get into the, um, you know, the nuts and bolts of a backdoor Roth IRA conversion or anything like that. But you have to understand simple concepts just to kind of put you on the right track. And and if you choose to, you know, use uh, uh, advisors or things like that, that's great. But you just have to have an idea because ultimately no one's going to care as much as you do uh, about your health, about your life and about your wealth. Well, thank you so much. Do you mind sharing with our listeners how they can find your podcast? Sure. It's uh, it's on all the different podcast uh, places like Apple or Spotify, and it's the Dr. Money Matters podcast. Great. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Patel, for a great podcast. We really appreciate your perspective on helping doctors learn about money and life. And uh, we just want to thank our listeners for joining us. And thank you, Jocelyn, for being a part of this as well. And as always, please know that at Savvy Doc Financial Planners, our mission is to help you take smart control of your money and your life. Thank you for joining us. Thanks again, Dr. Patel. Thank you very much. Please stay tuned for important regulatory disclosures. Savvy Doc Financial Planners is an SEC-registered investment advisor. The opinions expressed in this program are for general information purposes only and not intended for, to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual or any specific security. It is only intended to provide education about the financial industry and how we may be able to assist you. To determine which investments may be appropriate for you, consult your financial advisor prior to investing. Any past performance discussed during this program is no guarantee of future results. As always, please remember, investing involves risk and possible loss of principal capital. Tax considerations presented may not be appropriate for every individual circumstance. A tax professional should be consulted before making any decisions about your tax liability.